Um, hello, I'm Javier Sanchez. I'm researcher at the Data Justice Lab at Cardiff University. And today, Lilian and I will be speaking about our interdisciplinary work on um, hiring with uh, Lina Densik, that is uh, there. We critically examine some automatic hiring systems, which are definitely a trend perceived, uh, driven by perceived efficiency and cost savings, but also announced as a means of performing objective candidate selections and bias mitigation. Uh, by making such claims, these systems and providers uh, are both defining and claiming, claiming to solve the problem of bias in hiring. So what we will focus on this presentation is particularly on the technical and legal dimensions, since we don't have more time. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with this task is that the, from the human and algorithmic point of view, candidate assessment is a weakly defined task. Uh, this means that it's complex to define um, an ideal candidate, and it's complex to find generic ways of evaluating candidates. And this area has been always controversial, not only when automated by algorithms, but also uh, when done uh, like in an analog uh, analogical way. So um, what many products do to um, solve this problem is to find a way of comparing the candidates with the current workers of the company. So instead of explicitly defining um, what a good candidate is, talent is conceptualized as a predictive model uh, fitted in this data. This is important uh, since many products implement bias auditing with this understanding of a data defined, defined uh, employee. So companies such as Pymetrix do these games um, uh, to measure soft skills with, uh, with an app in the cell phone, for instance, to produce scores for risk, attendance, and other so um, soft skills. Then they fit a predictive model to um, to detect these skills and relate them to uh, job positions. Moreover, to create a description of uh, suitable reference values for people in a company, they do unsupervised uh, clustering to find representative points of these workers. So they tell the engineering team to play to the games and also the sales department, and then they, they do this clustering that has a lot of model assumptions that we are not going to discuss now, but you can find some of them in the, the paper. Um, bias mitigation strategies used in these products are well known for the FAT community. They include in processing and pre processing methods, but also the forfeit rule uh, to account for similar pa passing rates. Um, any input data that is um, detected to identify or benefit a group is said to be removed from the scoring. This includes performance indicators, so uh, that can score better for some groups. Um, for instance, in the validation study of Phymetrics, they uh, measure uh, for differences across different US groups, uh, like uh, ethnical groups, and age, and binary gender. So we find some uh, inherent limitations. Uh, first, that uh, bias is understood as an unconscious bias of the managers when performing these tasks, not other more wide concepts. Um, also, it is based also, uh, always in observable historical and data and passing rates, so we can know who is being filtered out of the process. Um, so this is a statistical limitation. Um, so what we can say is that um, bias auditing during a uh, candidate assessment is a, a necessary step and not sufficient. And also, as many people said in this company, uh, Building model from, models from historical data can very likely infer uh, historical inequalities. We find other challenges, such as uh, definition of non-binary people, multiple access understandings of uh, discrimination and intersectionality, and also to identify what is the optimization task. Uh, this is, for instance, if you are hiring engineers, you are optimizing for fitting people that looks like the engineers you already have in your department, for instance. And now Lilian will focus more on the uh, legal context in the UK. <coughs> the next slide. Okay, so um, I was the lawyer on this team. Um, I was not an expert on labour law, I was an expert on data protection law. Um, so this became an um, interesting new challenge. Um, so one of the very first things that occurred to me when I looked at the evidence that had already been collected by the, the team was, as was already said by the previous paper, 
that it was clear that at least two of the three systems we examined in detail were importing this four-fifths rule from US equality law, which does not exist in UK equality law. And I have to admit, my reaction to this was probably unpronounceable within the moderation rules of this community. Um, it seems remarkable. You know, if you import a consumer product that doesn't fit the health and safety rules of this country, if you try to import chlorinated chicken from the US into Tesco's, then it will be stopped at the border and there will be consumer product liability and there will be tests and there is a kite mark. But if you import a black box um, hiring system that, you know, instantiates, uh, embodies the law of another country, no one can see and no one seems to care. Um, as a lawyer, I really found this quite, quite depressing. Um, so that's the main point in a way that I wanted to make. I then went on to look at UK equality law, which is to some extent drawn from EU law that operates across the European community, um, but also has its own much wider wrinkles. And I found that we had our own set of tests, which are considerably less amenable to being coded or even embodied into either rule-based or algorithmic systems, um, using words like significant, proportionate, and legitimate, all of which I really defy you to either codify or embody from a machine learning system based either on a few hundred or thousand employee profiles or on one or two leading cases, which is what we have. Um, so, okay. A few other points I'd like to make in the remaining few seconds, how long have I got? Um, which is that there's another whole avenue, another whole instrumental avenue to play with here in Europe, which is data protection law. And I know you're probably all fed up by now of having the GDPR thrust down your throat, but I think that there is a, a good chance that the GDPR is a better angle than equality law here for dealing with some of these issues. Because as the previous paper makes very clear, one of the key problems here is the lack of transparency in that we're dealing with proprietary materials where we're trying to derive insights from patents and white papers and PR fluff, let's face it. Um, so with the GDPR, it's not just a matter of machine learning. Even if it's a simple rule-based system, we can derive considerable insight from subject access requests where we should be able to acquire not just the data that the candidate put in, but the profile that was assembled of that candidate, possibly the inferences that were then made from that profiling. We might even be able to use, and this is not in the paper yet, we might even be able to use data portability rights to take that data out and play with it outside of the proprietary walled garden. And I think on a collective basis, that has really got a lot of possibility. Um, a final point. Yeah. I can't make a final point, so I will just stop there. There's more in the paper. <laughs>